Welcome, welcome, welcome. What a grand day to just be in the flow and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it just boggles my mind that I can be in the presence of a holy, majestic, powerful, almighty God, but to, that he's in my presence astounds me that we could be in fellowship together, reconciled together, that we can walk in agreement, that I could actually be in the presence of God. I mean, I, I will never on this side of eternity understand such a love that God would literally tolerate me in his presence. But I know it's not me. It's the blood that covers me that makes the way for me to be in the presence of God, and it astounds me. Literally, literally astounds me. And then to operate in that flow, to be able to bring a word of revelation, to be able to speak his name with authority and power, to see miracles take place on this earth, and I have seen them. I have seen miraculous things, miraculous healings, I've seen a, 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 a man who was on his deathbed and they had called him just about dead, that they were ready to, you know, this is it. Rise up that very day. <laughs> Rise up that very day. I've seen people that I thought would never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, call him Lord and call upon his name for salvation. I have seen miraculous needs met in unspeakable ways, unimaginable ways. This is a grand time to be alive in Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. This is an exciting time of year. Christmas is just a couple weeks away. And God, you know, just when you think, I think I said this last week, just when you think you... You can't find anything new in his word. God just unveils something beautiful. And I have a word today that is so powerful and so promising. Um, I'm, it's called, but why? Just simply, but why? And one word, one word in this entire passage is what we're going to key into. So we've seen, if you follow the Christmas story, that the angel has come to Zechariah, and, and he uh, has spoken a word to Zechariah while Zechariah is ministering in the temple, that his wife Elizabeth, who had been barren for a long time, was pregnant, and that they would have a son, and that he was to name him John. And so we see uh, he, he doubts the angel, and the angel says, okay, from now on, until this baby's born, you are not going to be able to speak. So John comes out of the temple and he, you know, he tries, to, he's probably writing something in the, in the dirt or on a papyrus. And he's telling Elizabeth what has happened. And so time goes by, six months go by. And now we see Mary, who is visited by the same angel, Gabriel. And she tells, uh, he tells Mary that she is going to be visited by the Holy Spirit. And um, the Son of God is going to be blessed through her in her body, right? This is so exciting. And so after nine months of waiting, Mary is going to go visit Elizabeth. She's now three months pregnant. And she's going to go and visit Elizabeth. All right. But when the child, and so we know that whole story, and we'll get to that story, but I'm coming back to this. So when the baby arrives, when Elizabeth's baby is birthed, Everyone thought they should name him Zechariah after his father because that's Barjona, son of Jonah, um, Simon Barjona, um, son of Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, and that was uh, what they did. I mean, that was just like the tradition. Um, but Elizabeth and Zechariah were adamant about naming their son John. And they were determined to walk in the obedience that God had proclaimed in God's word over them, which was you were to name him John. 
So he immediately, after the baby was born, was able to speak. And when he was able to speak, he immediately began to prophesy and praising God. And I want to read that prophecy. We're going to key in on Zechariah's prophecy. One word. I'm going to show you the whole thing, but let me just do this. This is Luke chapter 1, and that little story of his prophecy is in Luke uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 67 to 75. Now his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, I love that, and prophesied, because you can't speak God's word without the Holy Spirit, amen? saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of the prophets of his holy, and he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's what, that's what Zechariah spoke before anything else, when his mouth was open, he said, I I'm just going to prophesy what God's given me. I'm, I'm going to speak forth what God has given me. But these are not the first, this is not the first time we've heard these words. This is not the first time because the promise came long ago, long ago, a thousand years before through the mouth and pen of David. We have heard these words before. Now, they're not exactly the words, but they are the same words, the same promise. So this is Psalm 18, verses 46 through 50. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation, so that's one way they are connected, be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. Two, he delivers me from my enemies. Three, that's exactly what Zechariah prophesied. You lift me above those who rise against me. Four, you've delivered me, five, from the hand of violent men. Therefore, I give thanks to you. Remember, Zechariah said, blessed be the God of, of, my, of, the God of Israel, for he has visited us and redeemed his people. Back to Psalm 18. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Great deliverance, six, he gives to his king and shows mercy, seven, to his anointed, to David and his descendants. This passage in Psalm 18 is the first prophecy of what Zechariah now is prophesying about Jesus, who is not yet even born. He's incarnate. But he's not yet born, and he will not come forth for another 33 years into ministry. God is, can I just say this? This has nothing to do with this Bible study. But God is faithful to his promise. God is faithful to his promise. We got a letter into the ministry today for a woman who, who sows faithfully into our ministry. We've been praying for her for months for this particular need in her life. And we, we've been faithful to pray, faithful to pray, faithful to pray. And she sent this letter today that God was faithful to her. God was faithful to her and delivered her, saved her, um, defeated the enemy. I mean, everything that we're reading right now is what God did in her life. And it's all here in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah's prophecy taken from Psalm 18. Now, whether he knew Psalm 18... He was, a, he was a priest. He, he ministered in the temple. I know he knew God's word. And I wonder as God is uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, God is inspiring him to speak out what God had promised from Psalm 18. So just at the outset, God keeps his promises and he fulfills his word. No matter what it looks like in the natural, hold on because God's promises are Oh, yes and amen. This promise from David 
took a thousand years to come forth, but God never left it. God never forsook it. God never forgot it. And the promise was sure. Amen. Amen. We will see that Zechariah beautifully proclaimed what was about to take place in all of Israel. He foretold the ministries of both John the Baptist, his own son, because you'll read that next if you go forward in Luke chapter 1 after this, and Jesus both. And he said this, he said that God has come and visited his people. Now, I want to stop. This word is an exceptional word. Oh, it's an exceptional word. And the word visited means four things. And this is what I want us to hear. I, I, when, I, when I found this, when I was studying, I got so excited, I, I made two phone calls to my prayer partner and my, my sister in the Lord. Uh, she's my closest family um, that I have in my, I mean, in my whole life. She and her family, that's my family. And they're both on my board, but beyond that, they are both my closest friends in this world. And I called them. I said, you will not believe what I found. So it says that God, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now that word visited, okay. First it means to inspect. So God, now to inspect something, you have to keep your eyes on it and you, you look over vigorously. Uh, you don't, you don't just like, like casually look at it and say, okay, I've inspected it. No, you inspect it and you look at it. You look to see what's going on. If there are any um, deficiencies in it or scratches in something, whether there's, um, there, there, it needs to be fixed somewhere. You're looking and he's inspecting, inspecting us. He's looking down and his eyes are ever on us. I love that picture. He visited us because we think visit us and just come, right? Okay. So inspect. And then it says, the next word says to inspect that is by implication to select. So first God, I'm just reading the definition as it appears in the Strong's Concordance. Not making it up. So he inspects us. And then he selects us. You, 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 you. I mean, Jesus came for the whole world. He came for the whole world. He selected us to be partakers of Jesus. He selected us to be partakers. And then it says this, it means to inspect, that is, by implication, to select, and then by extension, to go see. To go see. So this is what the word visit, visited means. It says God has visited his people, us. He has inspected us and, and sees that we're in great need. He's inspected and said, there's a problem. And from the very beginning, remember this was way back, way back in David's time, a thousand years that God was working on, on redemption, working on salvation for us. But he's inspecting us and he said, there's a need, there's a great need. And then he selected us and he said, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you people. I'm coming for anyone who will come to me, who will call me by name. I'm coming for you. Why are you coming, God? See, this is the but why. But why are you coming, God? I'm going to come see you. I'm going to come see you. I've inspected you. I've selected you. And I'm coming to see you. And the fourth word means to relieve. To relieve. He inspected us to see that we needed him. He selected us because we needed him. And then he uh, came to see us because we needed him. And then he relieves us because we need him. We need him even now. This literally says that God has come and is now doing, it's an action, doing redemption. He has started the process of paying the price to loose us from the slavery of sin and death. This is why he came. To visit us, that definition, oh, that lit me up inside. Just that definition lit me up. But here's what he's done in Luke 1, verse 68. I'm going to go back and do verse 1, verse 68. says this, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited his people and redeemed us 
He has redeemed us. That means he has bought us back. Jesus wasn't even born yet. This is Luke chapter 1. Mary is only three months pregnant when Elizabeth delivers John the Baptist. But the process has begun. Jesus has left the throne. He has come and has been incarnate. He has um, become man. And the process has become. And even then, the, the way, the redemption had begun. He has come and he has redeemed his people. The culmination of the Old Testament prophecy was about to come to pass. And the picture of it is beautiful. And then it says this in Luke 1, 69 and 70. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Now he spoke through Micah and Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah and David. He spoke through them all. And it says that he's raised up a horn of salvation. Now we have to stop for a sec. Because in the Bible, the horn is symbolic of power. It's not just like a horn, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, like blowing a trumpet. It's a horn of salvation is just, it's, the, it's, a, it's a colloquial saying that means power. When you have a horn, you have power. And so what God says is, praise be to God, the Lord God of Israel, because I've come. I have come and I have redeemed you. I have bought you back. I have ransomed you back from the curse of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And then it says he's raised up a horn of salvation, a powerful salvation, not just a salvation, a powerful salvation for us in the house of David. A salvation so powerful that it can deliver us from the evil one. It can, I mean, that word salvation is such a big word, such a big word. And it encompasses everything about our lives. And it's done with power. This word salvation is a huge word. It not just doesn't just mean to be saved from sin, but everything that would hurt us. This includes sickness, poverty, depression, confusion, and a whole host of other things that hinder us or hinder God's will for us. That's what he's done. But why, God? Why have you visited us to inspect you, to select you, to come to you and relieve you? Relieve us of what? To redeem you, to redeem you with a power that is unspeakable, un, it's unmatched, it is unparalleled. It is the dunamis of God. And then he says this in verses 71 through 73. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. This salvation not only includes the things that come against us, but it protects us from people and spiritual forces who come against us, who would try to stop us from carrying out God's plan. God has already taken care of it. This is what Zechariah is prophesying, that we should be saved from our enemies. When I, was in, when I grew up in Baltimore, I was born and brought up in Baltimore. I didn't move to West Virginia until 1988, but I've been here in West Virginia now for over 30 years. But I belong to a ministry uh, was one of the, the leadership of a ministry in Baltimore that started with six of us, six of us. And when I left there, we had over 400 people in this ministry. It was a, it was a powerful ministry, and we did, we, it was just powerful. We would bring people in, they would get saved, they would get sold out, and they begin to serve, going out. For, uh, it was just powerful. But we did worship. We, we met on a Friday night, and we had worship. And one of the songs we sang was Psalm 18. Um, and the chorus goes, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. That's what that song was. And that's what it means. 
Um, the Lord liveth and blessed be our rock, the God of our salvation. It's a powerful salvation. Who can come against us? Who can come against that kind of salvation? And so this is just a powerful, powerful prophecy of what God is doing for us even now. Prophesying through Zechariah, who was speaking forth what I believe David had said in Psalm 18. Now, in this point in Israel's history, it may have looked like God and the covenant that he made with Israel, with Abraham, had failed. The nation had been conquered by the Roman Empire. There was no real supernatural spiritual ministry. There were a bunch of laws and a bunch of Pharisees, but there weren't miracles and wonders taking place. There were no signs taking place. It was dark. It was a dark time. Remember, God had been silent for 400 years after the book of Malachi closes. But now light was about to break through in their darkness. God was raising up the answer to centuries of prayer. The Messiah was on his way. Ah, oh, powerful. But this is probably the most powerful part or the most important part of the prophecy. It reveals the purpose of all that God is doing. Because it says here, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might, this is verse 75, might serve him without fear. Serve him. See, here's the thing. But why? But why did you come, God? Why did you send your son? Well, I came to visit you. Why? I was inspecting you. And then I selected you. And then I came to you because I had to relieve the suffering. I had to relieve the power of the enemy. Why? What'd you do? How'd you relieve it? Well, I, I redeemed you. I raised up a powerful salvation for you. I've saved you from your enemies and for all from the hand of those who hate you to show mercy, but here's why. So that we can serve him, and I love this, without fear. Without fear, without fear, we can serve God, how? In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Why, God? But why did you come? Why? We, we can now walk in holiness and righteousness. You see, there's a redeeming and there's a reason for that redeeming. There's a reason for that saving. There's a reason for that protecting. It's because the Lord's desire is to have a people who will serve him now without any fear. Praise God. Praise God. We can now walk in holiness and righteousness. We don't have to fear death or hell or the grave. We are no longer separated with God. We don't have to fear God's wrath. We can look forward to the glory that will be revealed in us. And we can look forward to an eternity with God. I, I can't even imagine what those who heard Zechariah's message were thinking. What, what are you thinking? What are you talking about? What, what, who is this Messiah? Who is this Redeemer who's coming to do all of this? And where, where, when is this prophecy going to come into to place? When is it going to be revealed? When will you enact this covenant prophecy, God? Now? I mean, that's what Je Zechariah is saying. Uh, uh, how does he know? He was with Mary. He saw Mary. Talked to Mary. She visited there for months and visited them. And he heard the story. He heard about Gabriel coming to Mary. He heard about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. He heard about the dream that God had given Joseph about Mary. He had heard it all. And so when he is prophesying, he, he is not just prophesying like, okay, way down in the future, is this going to happen? It's happening now. It's happening right now that the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one that has been foretold of for years and years and centuries and centuries, is here. Well, you know what? He's here. C can I tell you? <laughs> He's here. Right now, this Jesus is here. I can't imagine what they were thinking. Maybe they, they, 
they remember hearing something like this before. But hopefully faith was being raised up in their hearts. They were given a hope that they needed and awaited the ministry of the Messiah. I hope this raises faith in you. I hope this raises a faith in you. That your Messiah has come. He's come to visit you. Let me just make it very personal. He's inspected you. You. Not just the you. He has inspected Jenny Fister. And he said, I, I've selected her. He selected everybody. But I selected him back, right? I selected God back. He said, I'm coming to her. I'm coming to her because I need to relieve the things in her life. That's what he's doing for you. That word visited. Oh, circle that in your Bible, write it and highlight it. Visited. Inspect, select. Come to us and deliver us. That's what he came. But why? Why? This is why. This is why. Let this raise hope in you. Let this raise faith in you that your Messiah is here now to redeem you, to deliver you, to save you, to protect you, and to send you forth to serve in his name without fear in righteousness and holiness. What a Christmas gift. What a Christmas gift this really truly is. If you do not know this Jesus, this baby that we're celebrating now who was born in a manger, who grew to be the Messiah, went to the cross for you, took the sins upon himself. He's coming back again soon and very soon. He's coming back as king. He came as a baby, but he's coming back as king. And if you don't know this Jesus, this is the time of year that we just let us help you find him. Let us help you find him. It's a beautiful life that he is painting his life with yours, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.